3,000 years ago, in the leafy green forests of New Zealand, the big beady eyes of a giant locked onto what would be its final meal. The giant in this case was a North Island giant moa, a bird that stood three meters tall, and its quarry was a tasty fern. But just as it leaned over to take a bite, another bird swooped down from above. The enormous host eagle weighed less than a tenth of the moa, but speed was on its side. Its massive muscled wings propelled it down fast enough to knock the moa off its feet. And once on the ground, the slashing of the eagle's talons did the rest. This scenario could have been avoided had the moa been able to fly. But moas were radites, a group of birds that today includes ostriches, emus, cassowaries, and kiwis. And almost all radites are flightless. Yet despite this, radites have spread all over the world, to Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and South America. And there are fossils of radites in Europe, Asia, and North America, too. Now that's a lot of ground to cover for birds that can't fly especially since these continents have been completely separated for about 80 million years. So how did radites end up all over the world? And how and why did they stop flying and still manage to survive? To explain how different radites got to where we find them today, for a long time, scientists followed a hypothesis that came to be known in the 1990s as, wait for it, Moa's Ark. Under the Moa's Ark hypothesis, there's one simple explanation for how flightless birds colonized the world. They all shared an ancestor that was flightless, and then members of this already flightless group were separated as the continents drifted apart. So the Ark in this case was the supercontinent of Gondwana, which finished splitting apart about 80 million years ago. This hypothesis is the simplest because it requires that radites lost flight only once and have been flightless ever since. It's also called the vicariance hypothesis because it refers to the type of speciation that happens when members of a once-related group become separated by geographic barriers. So this model supposes that the moving continents split an ancestral group into isolated populations, which then took different evolutionary paths and became separate species. And this idea held together pretty well for a very long time. After all, the bones of modern and extinct radites all look remarkably similar and seem to support the idea of a common flightless ancestor. But in the late 2000s, new research into ancient DNA blew this theory into pieces. If the Moa's Ark model were correct, then radites that live closest together would be more closely related to each other than those on different continents. So kiwis should have been closely related to moas, for example, because they're both native to New Zealand. And ostriches of Africa should have been close relatives of the extinct elephant birds in Madagascar. Likewise, the rhea should be a close relative of the tinamu, another South American radite, though the only living one that can fly. But a study in 2014 analyzed the DNA of modern radites as well as that of the extinct elephant bird and the moa. And the results showed that the relationships among these birds was very different from what we thought. It turned out that most radite groups that lived on the same continent weren't closely related, like, at all. So kiwis weren't closely related to moas, even though they both lived in New Zealand. Instead, kiwi DNA showed that they were closer to the elephant bird, which lived all the way over in Madagascar. And moas turned out to be more closely related to the tinamu in South America than they were to any other radite. And ostriches, well, they turned out not to be closely related to any of the others, belonging instead to their own lineage that branched off from the rest much earlier. Now, this genetic data not only revealed which birds were more closely related, it also showed when their evolutionary paths diverged from each other. Using that method we've described before, the molecular clock, the DNA data showed that many of these groups split during the present Cenozoic era, long after Gondwana had broken up. For instance, according to this genetic research, elephant birds and kiwis diverged in the Eocene Epoch, about 50 million years ago, and moas and tinamus parted ways about 60 million years ago, back in the Paleocene. But those old ostriches split apart from the other radites way back in the Mesozoic era, some 76 million years ago, long after Africa split from the rest of Gondwana. So all of this meant that the moas arc hypothesis couldn't possibly be right. Suddenly, the story of the radites was infinitely more complicated, because now there could have been only one way that all of these related birds could have gotten from one continent to another they had to have flown. But that would require that radites flew to different continents and then became flightless multiple times, instead of just once. In fact, our new understanding of their family tree shows that all of the closest shared ancestors of radites could fly. And that in turn means that radites had to have independently lost the ability to fly at least six different times. Plus, because many of these birds evolved to get really big, but their flighted ancestors were likely small, this suggests that radites also evolved into their enormous sizes at least five times. And all of this new genetic data also allowed scientists to more accurately place fossil birds that were too old to yield DNA in the family tree. With this data in hand, scientists in 2017 showed that the oldest of the radites weren't actually from Africa. They were the Lithornithids, a fossil group from North America. So radites originated in North America, then flew to different continents over and over again until about 27 million years ago. And in each new place, they eventually had descendants who lost their ability to fly and also often became gigantic. These adaptations were so successful that almost all the living radites are large and flightless, and the flighted ones are mostly extinct. But flight is one of the best superpowers an animal can have. I mean, I wish I had it. So why did the radites lose it? 
Well, flight is energetically really expensive. And if you can get all your food on the ground and not be too worried about predators, then sure, flight isn't really necessary, even if you are a bird. But living on the ground may only have become an option in the first place because of one key event, the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs. That's right, as the Cenozoic era dawned after the extinction of the dinos, many ecological niches were left empty, especially on the ground. For example, the terror birds were quick to adopt the niche of apex predator in South America, which the non-avian dinosaurs had left empty. Likewise, another bird group, fondly known as the demon ducks, lost their flight around the same time as the radites and filled an herbivore's niche in Australia. So in the absence of the hadrosaurs, triceratops, sauropods, and many other big herbivorous non-avian dinosaurs, there are suddenly plenty of room for radites to browse around without competition. Which is why most of them are herbivores, though some, like the ostrich and the kiwi, have become omnivorous. And many radites may also have gotten really big to help them live on the ground. After all, large body size can help protect from predators, but it's not clear which evolved first in some species. Were they flightless and then became big, or did they become big and simply outgrow their wings and lose the ability to fly? And if being a massive ground-dwelling bird has proven to be so great for radites, then why are the biggest ones, the moa and the elephant bird, extinct? Well, that one's easy. It's because of us. Humans arrived in Madagascar 2,500 years ago, and about 1,500 years after that, elephant birds disappeared from the fossil record, although there were some rumored sightings of them up until the 1500s when Europeans arrived. And in New Zealand, moas went extinct about 500 to 600 years ago, just a century or two after the arrival of humans. In both places, archaeological sites show that humans hunted the big birds, but not just the birds themselves. What we were really after was their massive eggs. And for radites, that was a real problem. That's because radites don't lay as many eggs as other birds do. Instead, they invest a lot of energy into fewer, larger ones. Producing and protecting such big eggs puts a burden on the mother, but it also means that the young are much more developed and require less care after they hatch. So after just a few centuries of overhunting by humans, moas and elephant birds could no longer replace their populations and vanished into extinction. So it wasn't huge eagles that brought about the end for these birds, nor is it their inability to fly. But if the evolution of radites has taught us anything, it's not to underestimate their stubborn evolutionary trajectory. Many of them stopped flying and it proved to be an adaptation that served them well. And the same could be said for many of the other flightless birds that aren't part of the radite family. So who knows, maybe someday, thousands or even millions of years from now, we'll see massive herbivorous birds walk the earth once again. Thanks for joining me today, and big thanks to our eontologists, Jake Hart, John Ivey, and my bestie, Steve. Now, what do you want to learn about? Leave me a comment, and don't forget to go to youtube.com eons and subscribe.